great to be here. Um, I guess you guys had the biggest chapter of FAS. Certainly the best turnout I've seen in an FAS <laughs> lecture, so it's gratifying. Thank you for being here. Um, I've been working on the St. John's River. I'm going to come over this way. I'm going to move around a good bit. And I'm pretty loud, but if I'm not loud enough, just tell me to turn up the volume in the back there. I've been working on the St. John's River for almost 20 years now, since I arrived at the University of Florida in 1998. After spending uh, about a decade or more in the middle Savannah River Valley that separates Georgia from South Carolina. And so I've always been a kind of a river guy. I just started working on the coast lately, but I've always been working on rivers. And when I came down to, uh, to Florida, the first thing that struck me was that this is a different kind of river from what I'm used to. The Savannah River, of course, has a, a great deal of a relief. Its headwaters are in the Appalachians, and it goes through the Piedmont and the coastal plains before it reaches the coast. So, you know, several hundred feet of elevation. The, the St. John's is less than, it's only about 25 feet total uh, relief from its headwaters to its outlet uh, in uh, Jacksonville. And so it's, it, uh, it's, a, it's a river, uh, sorta. <laughs> it has water running through it, kinda. It's more like water slogs through it. When it floods, of course, it courses through a little bit faster. But any given day, it, it's pretty sluggish, and it seems at times that it's moving backwards if the wind's blowing in the right direction. As you know, it's tidally influenced all the way up to Lake George, which is off to the distance there, the upper left of that slide. And bull sharks can be up in there, blue crabs are up in there, and the mullet get up in there. So it's a strange kind of river, it's a different kind of river. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about today is this long history of human experience on that river, starting about 9,000 years ago. We can't cram 9,000 years of human experience in a 40 or 50 or even an hour long talk. But I do want to highlight uh, the, the features I think are most important, which is that there's a history that runs through this because of what humans not only uh, did in their day-to-day -day living, but they memorialized it and they put uh, shell monuments all throughout the valley, particularly in the middle part of the valley where I've been concentrating most of my work. These are largely shell mounds. There's earthen mounds too, and there's combinations of earth and shell. And for the longest time, I think Florida archaeologists have emphasized what that means about environment. Certainly, uh, at the end of the Ice Age, Florida was much different than it is today. It was twice as wide as it is. Sea level was down 80 to 100 meters from present levels when humans arrived here. Uh, this would have been a very dry environment. There would have been uh, none of the springs that flow today would have been all that active. There certainly would have been some surface water, but nothing like this. So the emphasis in Florida archaeology for the longest time has been, how did those environmental changes, how did it get so wet, and how did those environmental changes influence the course of, of human history? Uh, it certainly it affected the availability of, of freshwater aquatic species, like shellfish and the fishes, of course, that people enjoy very much. It certainly changed the landscape in terms of what was inhabitable. It's tough to find, find dry ground today. It wouldn't always been that way, of course, but today it's very difficult to find a place where you could camp out and be safe from seasonal flooding high enough that you don't have to worry about uh, the occasional winds blowing the water up on shore and so forth. So the answer has been on that, but really the story I want to talk to you about is, is how, the, how these people that lived here uh, domesticated this landscape, turned it into a landscape of cultural monuments, and how that accumulating history over all those centuries, over all those millennia, uh, led to a really deep sense of heritage and legacy for the Native American peoples that lived there. We see not only a tremendous amount of activity, but we see them honoring that activity or treating that activity much like archaeologists do today. I really firmly believe that a lot of the Native American peoples that I study were archaeologists too. They dug a lot of holes. <laughs> they did. And they ran into a lot of stuff, and when they ran into that stuff, it's pretty clear to us that it was, it was consequential, that they had to confront it, they had to make sense out of it. So a lot of what we see that we call monumental is actually paying homage to the past, their interpretation of it, and, and their mounds are basically their history books. The layers in the mounds are the chapters of those books, and we can peel them back and start telling the story, okay? So I want to I wanna really emphasize that aspect more so than the environmental. Before uh, Euro-Americans show up, or Europeans show up, uh, with their African slaves and so forth, that started to modify the landscape in a huge way, the middle St. John's from about Lake George down here to Monroe was populated by all these shell mounds. We don't really know how many, but certainly there were a score of them. I think there might have been hundreds of them, but it's hard to tell. <coughs> they range from relatively small affairs that would have fit inside this room to ones that are the size of three football fields. 
The one at uh, Mouth of Silver Glen Run that I'll emphasize today was the largest in Northeast Florida when Jeffries Wyman from Harvard University saw it in 1872. He was awestruck, and he should have been, because it was an enormous, enormous amphitheater of shell. But they were mined, as you can see here on the bottom right, the Bluffton site there in the middle part of the map there, was mined away for road aggregate, very common practice. It was, it was mined for construction purposes, for tabby, for aggregate for roads, fertilizer, any number of purposes. And a lot of this took place in the earlier part of the last century. Uh, I think people were well aware that these were Native American sites, but they were regarded as being just trash heaps. So there wasn't a lot of like cultural significance attached to these things. If they were no different than the, than the county landfill, then digging it up and moving it around really isn't that big a transgression against people's sensibilities. It's just you know, basically a practical thing to do. Um, uh, C.B. Moore in the upper, uh, uh, upper right there, C.B. Moore visiting um, Hantun Island in the latter part, or the, or the very late part of the, of the 19th century, documented some of the natural effects as well, that there was erosion to these things. That's a big cut bank where the channels cut through and, and uh, obliterated part of that mound there. So the landscape before uh, the 19th century, certainly by the third, early part of the 20th century, had been dramatically changed from one that was populated by all these mounds to very few that are left intact. It doesn't matter, us archaeologists actually don't mind working with things that have been impacted like that. And in fact, there's a weird irony that having some of these things mined away, exposed the basement, exposed the bottom of them in a way that I never would have been able to do uh, with today's permitting and, and the labor and, and economic cost of doing that, right? So in, in a sense, in a very perverse way, they gave us a favor in some of these things so that we can get to the basement of these things and figure out what's going on. Now, it is made up of shell primarily. Most of these mounds consist of a shell species known as Viviparus georgianus, the banded mystery snail. Come on on the left there. It's beautiful in its natural state as, as it sits in a mound for a few thousand years. It turns just a stark, plain white. But it is banded. And it's not that big because it's a live-bearing snail. So Viviparus is live-bearing Latin or whatever. Um, that makes up well over 90% of these mounds. And then there's Pomacea, which is the apple snail. That's a minority species, but that's found uh, consistently through layers. You can see layers of, of the larger snails going through there. Those are the apple snails. And then we do get Uniatids, or basically freshwater clams. These actually show up more often in pits rather than mounds, and we clearly know that they were eating those. They're, they're cooking them in pits the way we would. You can steam them in pits, you put some fire in there, put some vegetation out, put a lot of shell or shellfish in there, more vegetation, earth, come back a couple hours later and you get your meal. We know they're doing that. We don't really know to the extent, the extent to which they're consuming these lowly little snails. They're not much bigger than a marble, and a lot of the mounds are made up of ones that are juvenile, very small. They're certainly edible, but we tried eating them, so if you steam these things and pop the meat out, it's like eating uh, little rubber BBs. You know, they, they coagulate, and you got to chew and chew and chew. You better just swallow them whole. And maybe garlic and butter and a slow cooking method might work in a nice little French frying pan. Yeah, but, but basically, so one of the things that we investigated right from the get-go was questioning whether or not these things were actually being eaten in any significant fashion. Instead, were they collected as building material for making these mounds, or were they uh, basically used for some other purpose and then repurposed for making these mounds? We do know that naturally there's cases of these dying off by the millions uh, Lake Marion in South Carolina, there's a documented case from the 1970s of these things dying off uh, simultaneously, just huge populations. And then when they die off underwater, they're basically living off detritus uh, in relatively shallow water. They get gaseous, like we all do when we die, and they float to the surface, and then prevailing winds can push them to the shoreline and create these big windrows of shell. There was one reported there several miles long uh, along Lake Marion. So imagine having a source of, of clean shell that's available for just scooping up with baskets and taking over and putting them on the mounds. So we investigate that. The guy who's coming to look at those burials tomorrow is a stable isotope, isotopes specialist, and he can look at the bone and tell us you know, what kind of diet they had. The little bit of work that's been done shows that they really didn't eat, the, eat this stuff all that much. It's there by, really, by the billions, but did they really eat it on a regular basis? Probably not. They certainly ate a lot of fish, though. Now, springs factor into this story in a very significant fashion because springs end up being 
the chief source of input of water into this river system. As you well know, Florida is known for its springs. We have wonderful big springs. The first magnitude ones, like Silver Glen here. Um, that's Silver Glen? That's Silver Glen. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Instead of having wonder if it's a salt spray or a silver glen. Um, it is rare to see silver glen without a bunch of boats and people yeah. in it, right? Yeah. I'll show you a picture later of how this really looks. <laughs> it's a rare day when it's done. This was the setting for the yearling, right? So Marjorie Kennan Rollins, that opening scene in the movie, if you know the movie, Gregory Peck, the narrator. I came back after the war to where it all began. Up the creek. He's talking about going into the backwoods of Florida. He describes it as being this pristine environment. He's going back to the very beginning. The metaphor here is that, you know, this is before civilization, the very beginnings of time or some such. Had Marjorie Kennan Rollins been at Silver Glen 4,000 years ago, she never would have penned those words. It was a metropolis. There were hundreds of people living here. They had massive mounds. There was all kinds of activity, people coming and going. And that's the way these springs are. But again, the emphasis primarily has been on the environmental impact of these springs. Clearly, when these springs came online, it went from a relatively dry environment to a really, really wet environment. And that has to do, of course, with the groundwater, the pressure. These are artesian systems, so wherever they have an opening through the limestone, they come up. The pressure at higher uh, levels, of course, pushes up more water. This all started about nine to 8,000 years ago with sea level rise. By the time we get to about six or 5,000 years ago, we're approaching relatively modern conditions of an environment that's, that's much better water than it was at the end of the Ice Age and conducive to human habitation for a lot of reasons. However, these things aren't the best places to make a living off aquatic resources. They're low in organic matter. They're, they're actually, the water chemistry is great in many respects. It's got a lot of calcium in it, so it's good for the growth of shellfish. But it doesn't really support the kind of dense, aquatic vegetation and animals that humans are coming to depend on. You take this out to the Lake Georgia, we find. You know, you get out to more uh, slack water, uh, backwater lagoons, uh, sloughs, things like that. That's where you're going to find your real stocks of the fishes and the shellfish that you're after. So this isn't really about the environmental or ecological or even economic potential of these. It's about being portals into the underworld, right? This is like the Maya cenotes that these are openings into a water, watery world that is divided into three spheres, right? That you've got an underworld, the world we live in, and then the upper world. So we'll come back to this point later because these are very significant for uh, cultural and symbolic reasons, much more so than economic ones. People glommed onto them quickly, but they didn't necessarily live there. They visited them like we do today. They did things there uh, ritually. Uh, they practiced their religion there, perhaps, but we're not seeing evidence that living right on top of these things was the best idea in the world. So people are attracted to them. This is more typical. Yeah, this is hard. This is horrifying. I hate to look at this picture. Just like, oh. Oh. yeah, not so much anymore. They curved this a little bit. Every time, you know, the north side of this is sort of the north side of this is, is federal land. It's U.S. Forest Service. The south side, 3,000 acres, is owned by the Juniper Club out of Louisville, Kentucky our host. They basically avail their land to our archaeological investigation. And they're wonderful stewards. I love these guys. Whether it's the club or the federal government, any effort that anybody's made to curb this sort of behavior uh, has led to death threats. Right? In fact, one of the, one of the uh, directors of the Forest Service, the ranger ahead there, only lasted for a couple years because he was worried that his family was going to be killed. They really, really are viciously guarding the right to do whatever they want with this, including dumping fuel and sewage and stuff like that. We work uh, downstream from here and watch you know, oil slicks go by. It's really horrifying, but I didn't come here to talk about politics. <laughs> this is a, it's been a gathering place for a long, long time. Where, where is this? Where is Silver this? Glen? It's a south, uh, basically the southwest corner of Lake George, so south of here, southwest of here. I have a map for you. Well, there's, there's a local map of it. Silver Glen's are a focus of our field school for, oh, about a decade. We worked at Pontoon Island, Blue Spring State Park, Salt Spring, uh, Lake Monroe, and one or two other places just short term. But our biggest investment's been on this landscape that we call the Silver Glen Run Complex. There's the main oil. That's the photograph. We're looking at a photograph right here. All those boats were in here. 
The outlet, of course, goes to Lake George over here to the, to the right. And there are secondary springs in here as well. And it's somewhere in this area where that opening scene of the yearling was filmed, where little Jody is laying by the side. He's got that little flutter mill, and he goes to sleep, and the deer shows up, and the raccoon and the bunny and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it is really idyllic down there. It's, it's magical because the water is coming up. Most of our springs, of course, when you see a boil, it's coming up in, in big, big quantities. This is little seep springs that like plays with the sand, so it's almost like a little lava lamp. You get this really cool effect there. I can imagine native people standing over the shaman and stuff like that and saying there's you know, basically forces here to deal with, right? In any event, this is what this landscape looks today. It's been badly impacted by mining. The Juniper Club themselves, um, you know, they, were, they were stretched out in the 1920s for cash, so they sold the shell at the mouth of that run there for $17,000. It was a quite a large amount. Uh, unfortunately, the guys that they hired to do the work got a little bit aggressive with their uh, drag lines, and they actually started to um, take away the land as well as the shell. The shell was going below the water table. And so they kept digging out the shell, and that was flooding the land. And at some point, they had to have a court injunction and get these guys off the land and, and do a restart. So they did a lot of reclamation as well. A lot of the stuff that, you okay? A lot of the stuff, a lot of the stuff that's in here is actually reclaimed land from that mining operation in 1923. Well, here I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to press this. It's going to fade into what we think it looked like before 1923. And it's more than thinking. It's based on a lot of archival work and archaeological work. But here's what it looked like before it was mined. Go see it again. <laughs> I like it. I'll credit Asa Randall at the University of Oklahoma, a former grad student of mine, his professor at Oklahoma, but then his poor little name has been cut off here. Sorry, A. Um, he's the tech whiz. So Asa took LIDAR, archival maps, and he went up to Harvard and he found the notes of Jeffries Wyman, who published a lot of stuff, but he didn't publish his initial sketch map of this. Asa found it at the medical library up at Harvard, and he took all those data and he reconstructed this landscape. As you can see, there's quite a few features here that are, uh, that are human, human made or anthropogenic. The big U-shaped thing was described by Wyman as being the largest shell deposit in all of northeast Florida. That's big enough to have a football field in the middle. It's pretty much like a stadium. You put bleachers on either side of that. You got yourself a NCAA football stadium. Um, and then these, these other ones which are linear, look as saying that across the way, 40, 42, 40, 42, 42, on federal land, are linear ridges of shell that are about five meters tall, a uh, little, little shorter perhaps than the ceiling here. And then, uh, these other smaller areas here, habitation sites, I'll talk a little bit about this one, Locust B, not much about these other ones. And what's interesting is we go pretty much from early to late. By the time we get over here to Locust D to the west, overlooking the boil, we're looking at 13th and 12th century to move one ancestry, right? But these things, this is about 4,000 years old, this is about 7,000, that's about 7,000, that's about 4,000, and underneath it, stuff that goes back to as early as seven or eight thousand. So it's a landscape that has a tremendous history, oh by the way, and a little sand mound there that dates to the 13th century, a <laughs> little burial mound. So it's, it's a landscape that has a tremendous amount of history and to walk over it today you might scratch your head and wonder, God, is there anything left? In fact, these guys have been told before, don't even bother doing archaeology out there, it's all, it's all destroyed. Uh, not the case at all. They, they mined us away, this was mined away, that was mined away, this was mined away, but again, the basements of all those constructions are still in place. And then all these habitation areas across this stretch of land here are fully intact. They've never been impacted other than the gopher tortoise and the occasional tree throw and things like that. The first thing we had to do in order to figure out the relationship of the water to human use of that landscape was figure out when that water became available from that spring. Now, Lake George was a, was a channel before... Uh, 8,000 years ago, it would have been a relatively narrow channel, and guys that go out there and dig for artifacts with these long poles, they find Paleo-Indian, 12,000 year old spear points, and they find early archaic, 9,000, 10,000 year spear points and knives, underwater, adjacent to the old channel of the Savannah River, which is now flooded by Lake George. Our question was, when did that spring start running, which is going to feed the lake, but also provide that channel of water between the, the spring boil and the lake itself. So there we go. We vibrate for this thing. Jason 
O'Donohue, uh, one of my former grad students who now works at BAR in Tallahassee. His job was to go out and do the geological work there, figure out when the springs became active, what do they date to, right? And so what he found out was that we get our first aquatic sediments adjacent to this channel here, way down here, uh, about 8,600 to 8,400 years ago. And then higher up, we get uh, stuff about 6,000 years ago, which coincides with the real first intensive use of this landscape and the first construction of these mountains. So water's available this early, but it's going to be a couple millennia before they really dig in and start to modify that landscape in any significant fashion. This is much earlier, this 8,600 year date is much earlier than we suspected. We thought maybe you know, 6,000 would be the benchmark for the onset of spring flow. So uh, the point being here is that you know, humans certainly like, gravitated towards these resources when they became available, but this wasn't the trigger that led to this, this lifestyle. There's, there's, there's 2,000 years we've got to fill in the gap there. And there's plenty to fill in, and we have to, of course, uh, venture out uh, away from this particular site to figure out what's going on. So what we do find now in the base of these mounds, again, they removed the upper part, so we're down at the basement. And when you get to the basement of these things, you can look around, you still see some shell, yeah, sure. There's artifacts, yeah, too bad. They've got race like that. But then when we dig down below that, we find even more stuff. And what we find, instead of things being mounded, there's a lot of pits, a lot of pits, like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pits. That black polygon uh, is the distribution of all these pits that date back as early as 8,000 plus years ago. They have shellfish in them, but that's not the primary constituent. Mostly it's earth, uh, sometimes charcoal, as you can see there. We got some oxidation from heat. There's some cemented shell in there. There's some dark earth here that has charcoal in it. And then there's a good bit of animal bone. It's a good bit of fish. There's, there's deer, of course. Um, and then we get hickory nut and acorn parts and stuff like that. So we think these are largely subsistence-related pits. They're digging these pits to process a lot of food. But they're also backfilling them in strange ways. It's not just random in many cases. We often get what we call structured deposition, where it looks like there's some sort of grammar or a recipe to how these things are to be backfilled. That's, that's speculative at this point, but we see later on it starts to make more sense when they start putting in layers that actually mimic the mounds. So in a sense, metaphorically speaking, these are upside down mounds uh, that we can, we can see. And again, we've got to remember, the reason they dug the hole to process food and then the backfilling of that are two separate activities. It could very well have two, two separate purposes here. We all know that animistic people, people with religion is called animism, have an intimate relationship with nature and their, their primary goal throughout all their activities is to achieve and maintain balance with nature. So, for instance, the Maya, when they hunt, until this day, if they're practicing their traditional religion, when they take the bones of the deer that they hunted, uh, just throw them into a, a refuse heap somewhere and pay no mind to them, they're basically uh, affecting negatively their ability to continue hunting successfully. So they take those bones to a ritual cave with a ritual specialist and put them into the cave so they regenerate the souls of the deer and the deer give themselves to the people. They have that reciprocal relationship. It's very important to understand that because a lot of the things we see are not just indiscriminate random behaviors, but things that were motivated by uh, religion, cosmology, belief systems, and so forth. So it starts off very early. We're not mounting yet, but we have a period of time here where they're digging these pits and putting in, uh, in some cases, structured deposits. Now, simultaneously, not at Silver Glen, but elsewhere in Florida, there's a tradition of burying people in ponds. You probably know the Windover site here at Titusville is one of about six that are pretty well known. There's probably another six that are kind of cryptic and we know very little about. But this is a tradition that started when Florida was pretty dry. It was starting to become wet, but this is at a time when they're putting people in ponds when ponds would have been at a premium, when surface water would have been rare. They're putting people in ponds like this. Whether they're staked down or just marked with these wooden posts, we don't really know but they're associated with it, and they've been dated really well in places like Windover. 168 individuals, you probably know the story of this, most of you have heard this, that they were so well preserved that the brains were still intact. And I think they're still sitting in a freeze dryer in Shams. Uh, and Gainesville, yeah. yeah. And it, this, you know, there, there's, there, there's science that can be applied to this that had to, they've done DNA and things like that. 
these are really old, so you don't expect the DNA to be all that well preserved. But geez, they're getting DNA out of, out of Neanderthals these days, right? So we we'll wait for that technology to get better to do that. Glenn Gordon did this work, the story behind this. I know, Kathy, you tell me if this is wrong or not. Uh, the people there at the peak uh, mining operation at this pond called the University of Florida, said, you guys better get over here. We got something really exciting. They got, ah, we're too busy. Okay, we'll call FSU. So FSU came over and did it. That's before I was there. That's before you were there. <laughs> we'll blame Jerry. <laughs> now, who would have known, right? And now we know better. Now that when somebody calls and says, hey, we got something you got to see, get over there right away. FSU will scoop you. Um, I won't talk much more about this. I really, I just want to make the point that we have, we really, at the same time, we have this tradition of interacting with water for mortuary purposes that helps us understand the relationship with water elsewhere, right? Okay, this little diagram is part of my fanciful thinking. We have this transition then starting at about 7,000 years ago where they stopped putting bodies, humans, interments in water, and they start putting them in bounded shell. And this occurs pretty much at the time when we're going from a dry habitat to a wet habitat. So the environmental shift here could be a factor, but the cultural shift is very conspicuous, right? We get a whole different way of interring people uh, upon deck. However, I would, I would suggest that what we're seeing here is just a symbolic uh, transformation and that mounds are basically ponds turned upside down and that the shell is basically the equivalent of water. They certainly came out of water. The shell becomes the medium of burial now in lieu of putting people in water. Uh, and there may be other factors besides environmental change, new people on the landscape, immigrants coming in from other areas with different ideas about how to deal with the dead. But this is pretty pervasive. We don't have any examples of pond burials that post date 6,500 years ago. And then the shell mounds and the burial mounds take off thereafter. Here's one here that helps to, to make the argument. The Bluffton Mound, that's the, the one that we're seeing the mining. This is an associated burial mound. Uh, William Sears actually was able to do pretty extensive work here and get a really nice cross section of this. So what you're seeing there is this line. Asa made this three-dimensional thing that just looks like a fried egg or something. I don't know. But, but there's a line through it, basically. It's this odd-shaped mound. But when you look at it, it's really it's a one-time construction. Mounds can be uh, multi-staged. This is a one-time This is one-time construction. So on the, on the base there is an old uh, habitation midden. They're laying a body on top of that. That's that three. Sand on top of that. Clean shell on top of that more sand, and then that black layer is a black layer of muck from a pond. Now, uh, when Sears dug it, he said he thought it was allega alligator feces. <laughs> well, that, if you've ever been in muck in Florida, it's like alligator poop. Like, it smells like it, it looks like it, it's awful, right? I've been up to my waist in this stuff. This is how we test the, the metal of graduate students. We take them out of the swamp, we throw them in there up to their waist, and if they don't complain after an hour, we accept them into the program. <laughs> Another body on top of that, and then more shell, and then an intrusive barrel on top. This to me, again, I mean, I'm a little fanciful in my thinking. I hope you'll forgive me for that. It's part of my imagination. I don't know where it comes from. Uh, this is a pond turned upside down, right? So it's a huge transformation in the way they're treating the dead. But when you peel back and think about the meaning and logic of it, it's not all that different, right? <coughs> now, the question then becomes, if we got this transformation, do we have any examples of shell mounds constructed on top of pond burials? That would seal the deal, right? If I saw that, if I saw a shell mound on top of a pond burial, I'd be like, man, that's not crazy after all. I might have actually saw, uh, figured out this pattern. So uh, if I came here last year and gave this talk, I would have said, no, we don't have any. I think we got one now. We just found this this summer. At the south end of the property is Silver Glen. This is uh, four kilometers south of where that big mound complex was. Little Juniper Run. There's a pair of mounds that are completely intact. They're back in the swamp. They're hard to get to. They're unrecorded in the state site files. At least they were until recently. They're, they're going in now. And the one there to the southeast, this one, is a habitation mound that has one meter of deposits above the water table and then two and a half meters below the water table. We haven't dug into it yet because we have to dewater it to do that. And dewatering it means a lot of technology and money. And so we're gonna go try to get grants for that and do that. The one to the upper left, we did shovel testing across here. And the one to the, to the northwest here, 
uh, we, we ended up having to suspend the testing there because we put in five shovel tests and four of them had burials. So we called the state, we were obliged to do that. Of course, we want to do that, follow the law, follow the rules. And Dan Seinfeld, he usually tells us, you know, whatever you got, document it, cover it up, leave it alone. No problem, we did. But he gave us permission to core it, and two meters below the water table there is, is archaeological deposits, uh, and I suspect that has human bone too. So that very well could be a pond or a depression that at 7,000, oh, by the way, got a rating carbon date of 7,700 years on it, on the base of it. That could very well have been a depression that had human interments in it on top of it, uh, shell mound constructed with burials. That would be the only instance of it, but it wouldn't surprise me if that logic that I just uh, I just offered to you uh, holds any water. Sorry, no, I didn't mean that. <laughs> okay, big transformation of 5,500 years ago. This time we can't blame it on the environment, I don't think. I don't think we're going to blame it on uh, changes in uh, water availability or productivity or anything like that. Here now we have, at 5,500 years ago, pretty good evidence that the, the, the reach of their involvement, the geographical expanse of the people living in this part of Florida, their involvement, had grew considerably to include trade with groups up in South Carolina and Georgia and all the way over to Mississippi. We start getting objects from those states, those areas coming down in the middle of St. John's, and in return, we think a lot of the shell beads that are made out of uh, saltwater shell fish uh, primarily the lightning whelk, are going up north and to the west, okay? The transformation in mound building is that they go from these shell ridges to these earthen conical mounds, sometimes with shell, often with shell, I should say, but interspersed with layers of earth. So now we have things that look more like the mounds of like the Hopewell or the Adena people of the Midwest. Conical mounds uh, constructed primarily for mortuary purposes, multi-staged and involving uh, different substances and objects from, from uh, far away. So uh, Tomoka, as you well know, uh, right here on the Atlantic coast, and then if you go down to Lake Monroe, Thornhill. In Thornhill Mound A, there was an individual buried there, a male laid out in an extended position that had two uh, banner stones, little miniature banner stones that are uh, spear thrower weights, some people would call them atlatl weights, uh, that were probably from South Carolina or Georgia, and then, uh, I can't remember how many, but a big, a big pile of shell beads along uh, with that. So we start seeing for the first time the inclusion of grave goods, and the grave goods include things coming from, from far away. And there they are. So the batter stones are coming from Georgia, South Carolina. Where I worked on the Savannah River, we had workshops where these things were being produced. There's a place up uh, near Richard B. Russell Reservoir where there's literally hundreds of these blanks uh, and preforms for making them. Stone beads coming out of Mississippi, they're made out of jasper. And then uh, we're also getting the Strombus gigas, uh, the queen conch, uh, turned into adzes, and those are being imported up. You can't get those uh, directly to the east in the Atlantic or the Gulf. They're coming from South Florida by way of the Keys or so forth. And then the shell beads are being produced, perhaps going out in the opposite direction. So these social fields are expanding outward. There's more uh, extra local involvement in the middle Savannah, or in the middle St. John, excuse me. And that's transforming things uh, socially and culturally in ways that we, we probably don't have to look to the environment to explain. Now in this context, we get, starting about 4,500 years ago, we get the oldest pottery in North America. The oldest may very well be in the Savannah River Valley, but we just did a redating of the oldest stuff there, and it's not as old as the stuff in Florida. So Florida's it! Yay! Actually, it looks like it's simultaneous. So Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina, from the Savannah River down to the St. John's River, starting about 4,500 years ago, innovates the first pottery in North America. That's really cool. And it's not only the first pottery in North America, it's really, really nice, fancy pottery. We used to think that they went through this long stage of development where they had this crude, plain pottery, and then they figured out how to make these forms, which are a little more symmetrical, and they started to refine the technology, and then he started to decorate it with all these incisions and punctations and so forth. We used to think that. We now know through good dating techniques um, that it's all simultaneous. It all happens at once. And we get at this time then, which is which, uh, something that becomes a Florida tradition for a long, long time, which is a separation between pottery that's used in, for ritual purposes and social purposes and pottery that's used for everyday purposes. 
Not much different than us having everyday China and then the stuff you pull out for Thanksgiving, right? So they had this stuff that was fancy, like the incised pottery of the upper two rows and the stuff that's also punctated here. They had this stuff concentrated at these shell mounds in locations that we think uh, would suggest to us they're gathering places, a lot of people coming together, big feast, and then a lot of vessels being broken in the course of the feasting, maybe in some cases like a Greek wedding, deliberately broken, thrown into the fireplace, stopped on the ground, whatnot. We certainly have plenty and plenty of pottery. That place is silver glide, literally thousands and thousands of pots were deposited there. So there we are, back to this where we started. Zach Gilmore, the brilliant Zach Gilmore, uh, another grad student of mine is now a professor um, at Rollins College in, in uh, where's that, Winter Park? Yeah. yeah. I was visiting there. Man, that's a nice place. <laughs> you, should see, you should see our offices at the University of Florida. It's like we're living in you know, a hovel in the face of a curling pit. And I go there and everything's like oak and mahogany and marble. <laughs> Makes you smarter too when you walk into places like that, I think. I feel that way when I go to Harvard anyway to visit. They would never let me in Harvard otherwise. So um, in any event, this place here, the big U-shaped thing, dates to this time period of the early pottery, 4,500 to 4,000 years ago. The northeast corner of this, the north ridge we call it, was just strewn with this pottery. When that was mined, a lot of that pottery, of course, was carted away with a shell, but a lot of it ended up in the water. So the club members over decades have been picking this stuff up, literally just big piles of it. And every place we've dug, of course, we find uh, stuff that's been redeposited for the mining, but we have literally just you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of vessels represented there. We also have a lot of it at this one. This is the second big monument. It's not as impressive visually as that one, but this is all human deposition. The actual outline of this naturally would be something like that. This is all mounded shell, and there's burials in that. But that has a lot of that pottery as well. And then the third location I want to show you uh, is actually a habitation site or a place where they're processing a lot of food. And there's a lot of pottery there as well. So Zach Gilmore, for his dissertation, did neutron activation, which enables him to determine the geochemical composition of the pottery, the clay and the temper. And then he did uh, petrography, which is thin sectioning it so he could characterize the fabric of the pottery. He learned that from Ann Cordell, a geologist at the University of Florida. Ann Cordell is probably the leading petrographer in the world. Um, she, she'd probably blush if I said that to her face, I know, but she really is really good. And there are very few people to do that because the, the learning curve on that and the time investment uh, is like you know becoming a concert pianist or something. It's really, really difficult to do. There aren't that many people to do it, but the results are unbelievably spectacular. So what Zach found out was that half of the pottery from this north ridge, and he looked at hundreds and hundreds of vessels, came from far away as, let me hit the next slide, I'm sorry. We need a map too. Eh, I'll leave it there for a second. That stuff up there in the north ridge, half of that stuff came from as far away as southwest Florida. It's a big, it's a big uh, assemblage of pottery, half of which is non-local. The stuff from the South Ridge, the plain stuff here is all local. And then most of the stuff from this locus here is local as well, with the exception of some of these fancy punctated and sized stuff. This is known as Tech Island in size. It's a rare type in, in uh, the St. John's, but it's concentrated pretty heavily at this particular site. And then the other mound had non-local pottery, just like the one there at the mouth of the run. So he does this, of course, by looking at the chemical composition. Won't bore you with the details here, but when you're looking at uh, the lime green is local, all local, 25, 23% local, 10% local, and a lowly 2% local there. And then all the blues and the purples and stuff like that are uh, at least not immediately local, places that are as far south <coughs> as uh, Charlotte Harbor area, but also some of these other sources here. Here's the location those shell mounds, right? So these are all dots where they've characterized geological sources of clay, and that's the reference collection for determining the, the provenance of this stuff. Uh, his book just came out, if you're interested, The Gathering at Silver Glen, University Press of Florida, came out this year. Uh, if you can get past the theory and the, and the technical stuff, uh, I, I go to chapter, the last chapter, read that. It's really, it's really, I'm so proud of him. You know the best part of being a professor? Watch your students do better than you, uh, and they all do better than me. I was really happy for these guys, especially in this economy that they get a job. 
you know, they had a family, in fact, just had a little son and his wife, and so there he is there, looking up and surprised to take this picture. That's my wife with that big hole in the back there, Megan. She's a zooarchaeologist, and she identifies all the bones. The Locust Bee location, where there's some local and non-local pottery, but the thing about this, which is different from the mounds themselves, is that it's another one of those places where we got just a lot of pits. And some of these pits were just incredibly mind-boggling. You can see where they intercept one another, one after another here. They're coming back and doing this over and over and over again. But some of them, right from the get-go, were big enough to put a Volkswagen Beetle in. Um, so we're talking about massive quantities of food processing. And again, primarily the, the clam, as well as probably fishes and other stuff, not so much the, the small snails, but then these snails are going in there in a structured depositional way. You can see a nice structure here, the way these things are backfilled and so forth. Again, uh, Zach and I think that we're looking at metaphors for mounds. These are subterranean mounds or mounds that are inverted, the same way the, the pond barrels are. Uh, granted, you know, a lot of my colleagues think we all be locked up somewhere in a rubber room for coming up with these crazy ideas. But given the scale of labor that went into building this landscape, knowing the mortuary significance of it, I don't think it's far-fetched to be using that kind of language and thinking of those kind of terms. I think it actually honors the Native American people to operate at that level rather than just attributing this to, well, you got a lot of mouths to feed. You know, there's something else going on here. So getting to the end here, yes. Um, it's about the springs. It's about the springs gathering water and making Florida the well-watered place that it is. Of course, we have a subtropical environment where we get a good bit of rainfall in the, in the late summer and uh, other times of the year. But if you know about the Floridian Aquifer, you know it's massive, but it goes, it has you know, underground sources that go all the way up into the Piedmont of Georgia, uh, at least the Georgia and Alabama. And then uh, you know, the, the outlets here, places like Silver Glen, are the result of all this gathering. There's a lot of local water that comes into here too. In fact, probably most of it's local water rather than water just coming from far away. But I think it's a nice metaphor for how these springs gather water and then they gather people and they gather this history up that people were gravitating towards them. They become places that were obviously very attractive to them. We think of these things today as recreational facilities or places where we can like, you know, still enjoy nature that hasn't been badly modified. As you well know, most of them have had, had bulkheads and, you know, piers and, and there's been, you know, other infrastructure. And then as we saw in that previous picture, uh, the abuses, of course, of, of people using them is, is unfortunate. But it is really uh, iconic Florida. And I think that that iconic value started 9,000 years ago. It wasn't something that had to wait for us to appreciate it. So what does it really mean uh, cosmologically? Well, these are portals, literally, into the underworld. They bring water up. Water's a medium that we know, starting in 9,000 years ago, was um, the appropriate place to put the dead. So it's not insignificant that that water in the underworld would have that kind of connection in these particular places. And then the upper world part, of course, isn't signified by anything in the water itself, but the mounds around them, right? So I can't show you what this looked like originally, but imagine this around this boil before 1920s, right? That it was elevated with shell several meters above, accentuating the relief bright white shell around glistening clear blue water that's bubbling up, life coming up for, forth from it, and, uh, and bodies in place in here throughout this whole thing. This is, to me, just remarkable. It's unfortunate that we still don't have these things intact, but the stories are still there to be told. So gathering water, the environmental thing's important, but what we have here is gathered bodies, gathered history, persons, objects, and then all this shell, which again is you know, representative perhaps of the other world itself. By elevating it into the upper world, maybe then the transcendence of all these spheres in these places. We know later that Mississippian people did this with posts. So a large post in the middle of a plaza connected the upper world to the underworld. We also know that smoke and fire, the sacred fires did the same thing. The trees that were burning the fire had root systems that were in the underworld. The smoke ascends to the upper world that had to continuously be burned in order to keep uh, the balance between this world and the upper and underworlds uh, in check. And I'll leave it at that, but just saying that I told you I can't get 9,000 years crammed in here. I don't really know that much about the last couple thousand years, other than we have this incredible village overlooking the boil uh, that is arguably Tamuquan ancestry, so 13th century, 12th century. 
when, you, when people ask you, oh, who, this is a very common question you guys probably have asked as the archaeologist yourself, and you've heard people ask you this. Whenever we do anything with Native American archaeology, one of the most frequent questions I get is that, who were these people? Were they Seminole? Were they the Cherokee? Were they the Tamuqua? And um, I can never answer that. When we start getting closer to the present, 12th, 13th century, I'm a little more comfortable saying, you know, we probably have Tamuquan ancestry here. And, and, you know, I can't verify that 100%. But if you ask me about, you know, who they were 8,000 years ago, I can't tell you. All I can tell you is that uh, they're ancestors of someone, and they were descended from someone. And, and the only way, I guess, that we could scientifically prove that is do complete sweeps of DNA of every stitch of bone we've ever gotten, and then make sure that we have really good representative living samples of DNA. But I don't know if the biological thing is as important as the cultural connections, right? You don't have to be of the same bloodline to share the same belief systems, to have the same sort of ritual practices. Look at Catholicism, right? Look at any, any institutionalized religion these days. And I think it's actually uh, the case that when we get to the, well, probably when we get to that the historic period, the Tamukwa didn't always see eye to eye, that the freshwater and the saltwater Tamukwa were not necessarily always in lockstep, and there were skirmishes and fights and stuff going on there. So it could very well be that the people we're looking at at this point in the 13th century over the, over the, over the boil um, had very little to do with the Tamukwa who were living, the ancestors that were living in this area and at the mouth of the St. John's. That's for some other graduate student of the future to do. Um, I'm working on the Gulf Coast now and I have the same issue. We start early and we end up late, but we're trying to figure out the early stuff now. And then all I can say now is when we got, I guess that's um, Rodman. Um, what are you going to say? I mean, I don't even know what side I'm fit on, uh, I'm on this. Humans have been modifying the environment for thousands of years. We continue to do it. I like to think, idealistically, that the way the Native Americans did it actually enhanced the environment. I don't really know that to be the case. Um, and I don't know that this is necessarily a bad thing either. Uh, they're talking about you know taking the dam away and bringing it back. Restoration is always a weird thing. Restoring the Everglades back to what? The Everglades weren't there 9,000 years ago. The Everglades won't be there 100 years from now. It'll be saltwater, right? So I, 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 I'm a little leery about recommending it. And again, I didn't come here to talk about politics. God help us if I did. <laughs> it's really hard to work these days. So I'll leave it at that. Um, I've gone long enough, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks for having me.